Chapter 31. The hawk's vision was limited, making it impossible to understand the whole story. However, as far as Sylvia saw, the knight tried to assassinate de Calaine first, which forced him to retaliate in self-defense, causing the knight to fall down the cliff and, ultimately, to his death. No, de Calaine definitely tried to save the knight, which meant he died of his own accord. Through her magic, Sylvia witnessed the scene unfold almost as if she was right in front of it. Even the conversations they held were transferred directly into her ears. With her eyes closed, she found de Calaine standing alone on an overhanging cliff. The fact that he didn't fall was indeed a miracle, but the conference was about to start in six hours. She thought he'd need another miracle for him to reach Burke in time. D. Culane looked up at the sky, seemingly directly at the hawk, which surprised her so much she ordered it to return. It would be impossible to observe further if the blizzard got worse anyway. It might also hurt the hawk, an occurrence she wanted to avoid the most. It was her very first creation, which made her want to keep it with her for a long time. If the mana in its mana stone ran out, she decided she would recharge it instead of replacing it. Come back. Sylvia opened her eyes after issuing the command, returning her vision to Burke's landscape. Oh, Ems. Sylvia? Who? As she sighed and turned around, she found herself face to face with the people from the kingdom that Sirio talked about. So this is where you are I've been looking forward to meeting you Tilda. It's a real honor to see you in person, Rookie of the Year. Greetings. I'm from the Judra family of the Riak Kingdom. Sylvia felt burdened by their weird responses. At the express train railway, the platform employee saluted a high-ranking official. It's an honor, Deputy Director. Deputy Director of Imperium's Public Safety Bureau, Lilia Premien. Coincidentally, she was camping in the northern mountain range when she heard about the train incident and was immediately dispatched to the site as the Deputy Director of Security. A surprise attack was launched, and an explosion occurred? Yes, it's a common occurrence in the process of traveling to Burt. The reward is even ten times bigger for assassinations that occur inside Burt. This is nothing special. The employee who appeared to be in charge replied. Premien glanced below the cliff. What about the casualties? None has been confirmed yet, but Professor de Calaine and the knight, Varen, are currently missing. He has a more detailed eyewitness account. Premien looked in the direction the staff was pointing at, finding a man with a blonde mustache and Alan, who looked like he was sleeping on the track. Yes, the wizard and the knight saved me, but when I came to my senses, the whole train had already fallen. Maybe the knights launched a secondary attack. The mustached man was talking to someone else when Premien approached him, who then pointed at the camera hanging from the man's neck. Is it okay if I take a look at it? What? Yes, but this is my source of income. I'll give it back to you immediately. Oh, okay. The man developed the film of the camera in an instant. Looking at some of it, Premien grew momentarily speechless. Huh? She smirked. The magic film contained one to two seconds before and after the picture was taken, like a video. In the photo, the train was floating midair. She deduced the initiator to be D. Culane, considering even she knew the identity of that magic. Psychokinesis. He suspended the train using it and very nonchalantly at that. He could even be seen reading a book. He was so relaxed he seemed like he was just holding up a pencil. Premien, who was looking at the photos, soon received something from someone from somewhere. A mana signal poked her in the back, causing her to stand still and interpret it. Knight Varen is dead. He tried to kill D. Culane, but it seems like it was an order. The head professor survived. Hmm. Premien let out a small sigh. She knew Varen. They were from the same clan, after all, the Red Box. Even though he had a lot of screws missing, he was an admirable man. His death made her feel bitter. But she felt relieved at the same time. He was a ticking time bomb, like Rock Hark. She was certain he would definitely cause trouble one day. What do you think of the photos? I know I'm the one who took it, but even I can't help but admit it was an amazing sight. I'm a magical analyst, but I would never dare assess Professor D. Culane's caliber, that's enough. Premien returned the pictures to him. Oh, oh. It's a ghost. An employee screamed, causing her to look in his direction. She immediately determined the newly found figure's identity even though he had just arrived at the track. Head Professor D. Culane. No one saw him come up. 
One moment, he was nowhere to be found. The next, he was standing within their vicinity alone. Without saying a word, he looked down at the cliff he had climbed while thinking about his limits. His psychokinesis could kill anyone, but it couldn't get through a knight's fortitude. Additionally, without mana, he was rendered powerless. His magic couldn't overcome a master born with talent and intense concentration. He felt a distinct wall blocking his path. A sense of dejection rose. If not for that unidentified help, it would have been him who would have been slammed below this cliff. Head Professor. Premian approached him. Your assistant professor is over there. He's safe. D. Cullane saw Alan on the track. Will that be all? Yes. He paused for a moment before replying. What time is it? It's 3.30, Premian answered as she had an unnecessary thought, she found his face fucking handsome. Six hours left. He weighed the probability of him attending the conference on time, which was beginning to seem impossible. For him to climb the cliff without the train with his low stamina, it would take at least a day. I'm sorry, but I need to ask this out of formality, head professor. What happened to the escort you were with? He died. Was it because of the attack? He hesitated for a moment, then nodded. I see. Professor, by any chance, can you straighten this track? Decolane tilted his head at her words and looked down on Premien, emitting arrogance unique to nobles. It was as if he was looking at someone inferior. She felt anger surging inside her for a moment, but she forcefully soothed it. If you can fix it, I'll call the train over with my authority. If he could fix the tracks before the blizzard got worse, she would be able to call the train on standby to resume its activities, increasing his chance of reaching Burke before the conference. It'll be beneficial for you, Professor, so why are you looking at me with those eyes? You're making me want to pull them out. It'll be much better and faster than walking. I refuse. Premian shut her mouth and rolled her tongue. I was born with the natural talent to irritate people, huh? Move. The real reason behind his decision, however, was his exhaustion. He didn't have any remaining energy left to spare on magic. She misunderstood the situation since he looked perfect externally, not realizing that internally, he was lethargic. Okay. Premian lightly bowed her head, then moved away from D. Colleen and grabbed an employee. Since you're not doing anything, clear the tracks before it gets snowed over even more. Yes, of course. One more thing. Is this the only train that goes to Burke? No, it's a bit far but there's a land route and a sea route on the other side of the mountain. Hmm? Premian felt something strange as she spoke with the employee, causing her to look back. But there was no one there. D. Lane had already disappeared. Was it acceleration? He probably thought it would be faster to run up the cliff while using support magic than clear the tracks. The wind was indeed intense in this area, and it wasn't impossible to borrow the strength of the elements. How much mana does that guy even have? His abilities exceeded imagination. He was even stronger than the reports made him out to be, considering he stopped the train from getting derailed using psychokinesis, drove back dozens upon dozens of nights, defeated Varen, safely climbed the cliff, and still had enough mana to spare to cast acceleration, and advanced magic, on himself. Was his mana capacity the size of an ocean? Premian clicked her tongue. Jung. The assistant professor grunted, finally waking up. Premian approached him and asked him as he looked around blankly. What's your name? What? Oh, me. Ah. Uh, your professor is gone. Unable to answer, Alan's tears swelled up. Premian frowned. He didn't go to the afterlife. He's just gone ahead to the Burke conference. So, your name? Oh, yes. Phew. I'm Alan. Premian spelled his name skillfully then showed him her writing. Did I get the spelling right? Alan nodded. Yes. Your age. I'm 24 years old. You'll have to excuse me. I'm his assistant. I need to follow him right away. You're already late anyway. Just wait for the next train. The current time was 9.30 p.m. The Burke conference would start at 9.53, which the elders considered as the time when stars aligned. That gave everyone 23 minutes left before they were considered late. Sylvia walked down the street of Burke's 4th district. Its roads were as complicated as the rumors described. The passageway was divided into two. Glithion and the other family heads traveled using the right pass, and the assistants traveled using the left. Sylvia, how's life at the university tower? 
we should try to have a meeting of our own. That, too, should be a good experience. The nobles walking with her frequently spoke to her. She answered roughly. Sure. Just as bright lights attracted moths, she attracted others to her side. Everyone was behaving so annoyingly around her simply because she had great talent as a wizard. Ah right, the head of the Euclide family hasn't arrived yet. Sylvia's ears perked up. It was Peña Villian, the assistant of the Magic Kingdom. No way, if Euclide gets eliminated. That'll be a huge affair. A huge affair? I have foreseen this to some extent. The current head's abilities are lacking compared to his predecessors, and he stopped gathering achievements three years ago. There's even a rumor that his talent is nothing special. Jiron spoke this time, the assistant of the Ruane family from the Empire. Sylvia wanted to voice out her thoughts, but she didn't say anything. Mediocre people would always be jealous of geniuses, and it showed. Meanwhile, geniuses would always recognize geniuses. Decolane's talent was only lacking compared to her. Commoners like them shouldn't disregard his capabilities. Oh, that's it. They had finally reached the front of the gate of the Elder's Hall, a majestic shrine. It was built on the top of a mountain that had its peak completely cut off, almost as if an ancient giant stayed there. Creak. The door opened as they approached, almost as if it had been waiting for them. Nervous, the nineteen assistants entered respectively. A spacious conference room greeted them. It was so huge that forty people wouldn't be enough to fill the place. Even four hundred people could comfortably gather here and attend the meeting. Around the vast round table, the nineteen family heads were already seated. There was only a single vacant seat, Euclides. Sylvia stood next to Glithion, who smiled when he saw her. The other assistants who were bothering her also stood beside their respective family's seats. Dong, 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 dong. Five tremors announced the time. 9.50 p.m. Three minutes left. Sylvia felt somewhat bitter. As expected, it didn't work. He couldn't reach the summit in time. Before we begin the conference. Abruptly, a loud voice shook the room. The person's condensed mana and his resonant echo made Sylvia's heart throb. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to all of you who have responded to our summons. The top brass, Zeekton. He was the candidate most likely to become the great wizard and a legend that had chosen to leave the secular world. He was sitting in the position of the great elder, the only power that existed independently on the round table, the seats of which were veiled by darkness. Zeekton couldn't see the families on the round table, and the heads of the family couldn't see him. Sylvia felt great pressure looking at him. Will I be able to challenge someone like him once I reach that kind of level? It was worth trying. I'll start the roll call. Zeekton's voice echoed inside. Like the majestic sound of war drums and thunder, it spread electricity all over her body. Glithion of Iliade. I, Glithion, head of the Iliade family, honorably responds to Burke's summon, Glithion said with ease, making Sylvia proud of her father's spirit. Bedan of Biorad. I, Bedan, sixth head of the Biorad family, bows to the great elder. Zeekton called several families. Judra, Ruwained, Vilion, and others. And they all formally responded to his call with their family's personal flares. At some point, however, Dika Lane of Euclide. When Zeekton called his name, the elders' hall fell into silence. Is Dika Lane not here yet? Zeekton said in the dark. Everyone swallowed without answering. An unknown tension was rising from underneath their consciousness. Euclide's elimination. It was clearly unexpected, but on the other hand, it was something they looked forward to. The other families had always thought of it, but due to his reputation as a wizard, they couldn't put their audacious thoughts into action. Dika Lane's downfall was what almost everyone gathered here wanted. Euclide's head, Dika Lane, doesn't seem to have arrived yet. If he hasn't arrived after the third roll call, his absence will be considered non-compliance to the summon. Zeekton's solemn dignity seemed to weigh down the round table. I Helm, the head of the Ruwained family, smiled in secret. He was once D. Kalane's close friend, but they were nothing more than opponents now. As a consequence, the Euclide family will be eliminated from the twelve traditional wizard families. His magical voice sounded merciless, making the round table tremble. Sylvia looked at the huge clock attached to the ceiling of the elders' hall. Fifty-three minutes had already passed. D. Kalane of Euclide. Since Burke's inauguration, Euclide had never been removed from the twelve families. Hence, 
If he failed to answer the summons after his name had been called thrice, his household would be eliminated from the conference after 200 years. Few mistakes could bring as much shame as that to a noble family. Dika Lane of Euclid. Sylvia looked around. Some held back their smiles, and some smiled openly. Her father was expressionless. Not one of them looked worried. In Sylvia's opinion, that was enough proof to think D. Cullain had lived his life improperly. She felt sorry for him. D. Cullain. The moment when the third call was about to be made. Screech. The sound of stone being scraped roughly echoed. Surprised, Sylvia looked towards the entrance. The main door of the conference room opened slightly, and a blizzard poured through the cracks. Zietin stopped. Everyone's gaze turned to the entrance and, with his body covered with snow, he entered, almost as if making a grand entrance. His suit was tattered and ruined, and his hair was disheveled. He looked like a monster who came back alive from hell. The unpolished image he displayed completely differed from his usual neat figure. Sylvia clenched her fist unknowingly. He definitely didn't look magnificent, but his aura was still impressive. No one dared to say anything as they stared at him. D. Lane, is that you? Zietin asked. D. Lane looked around in silence, then his blue eyes fell and stared at the round table. The smiles of those delighted by his absence were swiftly erased from their faces, and those who hoped for his elimination avoided his gaze. D. Lane. I demand an answer. Zietin spoke again. It was late, but D. Lane tidied up his clothes. He fixed his ruined suit and neatly swept back his snow-soaked hair. Just like that, he returned to his usual mean with ease. Yes, he said. It's me, D. Lane. As he stated his name, he strode into the conference room. His arrogance remained in his steps, his pride seemingly swallowing the entire hall. Von Grain Euclid. The gazes on the round table followed him. Only Glytheon laughed quietly with his head down. The head of Euclid has arrived. He didn't bow. No, he didn't even answer the call. He just arrived. An extremely arrogant flair, befitting his existence. Some of the heads creased their lips or clicked their tongues in discontent, while some immature assistants had their jaws open unconsciously as if his appearance and ego bewitched them. I apologize for not arriving on time. It took me a while to pull myself together from the incident. You're not late. Have a seat. He walked and sat in his rightful seat, reserved for his family. The moment he did, Sylvia marveled at the sight. The round table certainly didn't have a hierarchy in their seats. However, from the moment he appeared, it was as if all the weight was leaning onto him. But, since your assistant hasn't arrived yet, your right to speak will be limited to three times from the halfway point until the adjournment. He looked at someone who couldn't make eye contact with him, his eyes filled with vivid anger as if looking at the cause of the recent incident. I acknowledge it. D. Lane slanted his head. He couldn't even afford to say anything. His mana had already been drained, and this crazy scuttle had consumed his already exhausted energy even more. He had far exceeded, Iron Man's limitations. The only reason he could maintain his senses now was his unique, personality. Calm down, D. Lane. Everyone in the conference room furiously misunderstood the heavy atmosphere. Even I Helm, who always made provoking remarks every time they met, quietly fixed his posture. Still, the best wizard on the continent was Hugh Klein. Regardless of what the high society had to say about him, there was no doubt that he stood at the top. Since everyone from the twelve traditional families and eight new families has arrived, we will now begin the Burke Conference. The meeting began in that silence. Chapter 32 the first agenda of the Burke Conference was the appearance of demons, one of which I killed at the Mountain of Darkness. To start with, Zeekton demanded my testimony. The Mountain of Darkness is an area that has always been under-purified. There's always been more than enough monsters there, but I didn't expect to kill a demon that day. I caught my breath after my testimony. Assessil, the young head of the Bran family, added to my vague explanation. That means this has become more serious and much larger than the frequent appearances of the demons in the system. Not only that, the North is swarming with them. Command each school or cooperate with the church. Wizards need to be dispatched to the suspected area. She was a named character with mysterious green hair and a trustworthy head of a family with high convictions. Now that I didn't have the power to interpret, judge, reiterate or refute others' words verbally, I decided to agree with the messenger to close off my statement. That is correct. 
Assessel's eyes widened in surprise. Well, D. Cullain was the type to point things out, even if it was right. The other wizards didn't necessarily criticize this item on the agenda. First of all, if the church selects a suspected area, wizards can then be chosen and dispatched from each magic school. They had passed through the first item. The Linnell School, known for their destructive magic, has shown great enthusiasm in exacting the demon's punishment. But there was still quite a lot to discuss on the agenda, such as which schools would be dispatched, what countermeasures to apply on the areas where the demons frequently appeared, what revisions had to be done on the dungeon and demon hunting laws, and more. For almost four hours, the round table discussed important matters without end. During that time, I kept my silence, reserving my right to speak three times. We will adjourn for now to take a short break. In just five hours, I was able to get off the round table. I went outside to gather my senses, finding a petite man with brown hair stamping his feet near the exit. Alan. Ah, Professor. Alan shouted and came running. Hey, are why you all right? I'm sorry I'm late. Joining the conference while it's already ongoing is against the law, so I was left with no other option but to wait. I'm sorry. I shook my head as he became flustered. It's okay. It wasn't, though. I didn't know how many times I experienced mana exhaustion today. An ordinary wizard would have been down with a fever or died already. I could still feel some of its side effects, and I had only recovered, 300, mana during the five-hour conference. Um, professor. I heard that you saved. I told you not to cry. Alan bowed his head to prevent tears from falling. Cook. At that moment, I noticed something that made me unable to look at this kid innocently anymore. There was a factor about him that seemed rather unfamiliar. From now on, just stand still next to me. What? Oh. Yes, yes. But I couldn't disclose it here. If my thought was right, then I had to keep this kid close. I shouldn't show my emotions. If I wanted to live. We were given a 30-minute break. The heads returned to their respective waiting rooms, exchanging opinions and making deals as needed, but I just stayed with Alan. I didn't do anything else. Just like that, the break ended, and I came back to the round table and returned to my seat. Alan stood beside me. What is the wizard's stance regarding the red box? Zeke didn't open the next item on the agenda. At that moment, the atmosphere of the elders hall suddenly changed. No one had designated a right to speak, but a debate came up right from the start, one fierce enough to say that the red box was the wizard's Achilles heel. The red box is like a bunch of cockroaches. They lay eggs and constantly reproduce, and eat away at society. Bedin of Biorad poured out unfiltered criticisms. Assessel then raised her concern in a slightly uncomfortable tone. There's no way to distinguish the red box from other races, however. We can just invent one. We can use their blood as our basis. If the people in the university tower in the empire gather, there's nothing they won't be able to do. Bedin sounded very enthusiastic about the matter at hand. I helm, who had been watching silently, tried to say something, but Bedin gave him no space to interrupt. The red box somehow manages to group up among themselves. That might mean they have a leader who rallies them together. The red box was a unique clan. Their existence itself was weak and almost unnoticeable, but many of them had developed their own talents. And there was definitely someone among their geniuses and prodigies who united and commanded them from a safe place. Bedin managed to unveil the crucial information, but the leader of the red box should never die. According to the game's plot, he was a messiah, close to Buddha or Jesus. Their leaders most likely hiding off the grid, organizing and keeping their clan alive. Don't you feel disgusted knowing that they're plotting their schemes right under our noses? That alone is treason. Bedin, that's a mere speculation. It was because of their resistance that many wizards died 60 years ago, Bedin shouted back at Assessel's refute, who no longer replied to him. The uproar on the round table calmed down a little. Glytheon, who had been watching me since earlier, finally spoke up. What do you think, D. Cullain of Euclid? Everyone's gaze focused on me. Euclid. Since ancient times, we had been at the forefront of punishing demons, earning us a status that gave us great influence and power regarding matters related to them. Since I came from the world that oversaw this dimension, I was familiar with these events. According to that knowledge, it would be better to suppress the red box as much as possible. However, this world's common enemy was no longer the red box. 
that made the difficulty of the main quest in the future much easier. Long ago, they were our enemy. I calmly replied. But if you look at the history books one by one, you'll begin to understand that it was all a misunderstanding. Misunderstanding? Betin cut in, but my glare immediately shut him up. I continued. It was a misunderstanding at first. 237 years ago, Rodron, from the Rodron witch incident, was accused of being a witch and was pushed to a corner, only to be found innocent. I brought up concrete evidence. Extensive oppression against the red box stemmed from that incident, causing their clan's blood to spill. Naturally, they resisted. Their resistance shed more blood, and that blood birthed to a short truce. I saw it on the setup sheet, and I also read works of literature that addressed it. Both of those allowed me to come up with a controversial thought. As you said, there had been another political move 60 years ago. A mine containing mana stones was discovered in the Red Box's land. This world's mana stone mine was much more important than modern oil and natural gas mines combined. Huh? Political move? That was no political move. Betton slammed his hand on the round table. There was a lot to learn about that six-decade-old story, but that was another matter. I had to focus on persuading them for now. They are born from diabolic energy. There's no question about it. Shouldn't you know this more than others since you're a Eucline? Your family has been punishing demons far more than most of us. Bedin shouted. He sounded almost as if he was having a seizure. I shook my head. Eucline's tradition is to hunt demons, not the red box. The red box are demons. His outcry caused the round table to ring. If we followed his words, it could one day lead to a massacre. After Bedin's clamor, a long silence fell on the hall where all sorts of discourses had already been conducted. However, it did nothing but amplify the tension. I looked at him intently. Those words of yours. Can you take responsibility for them? To demonize an entire race was the same as turning them into humanity's common enemy. Bedin, of course, didn't answer. Control yourself from recklessly concluding and declaring races as demons. Remember, the very person who does so might just be the devil himself. I ended my statement with those words, causing the heads of the families to look at me with surprise in their eyes. Eventually, Zetan's voice came up. Bedin, please restrain yourself from uttering such ill-suited remarks. Since it doesn't seem like we will be able to reach a conclusion at this rate anyway, let's end today's conference here. The first meeting ended without a clear conclusion. It wasn't a big deal, though, since Sylvia had already prepared her resolve to stay here for three nights and four days anyway. The night was already dark when she reached the Rosary Hotel in the 4th District, there. Accommodation only allowed one person per room. Silva looked at the paper she received from the hotel's caretaker. Night rules for the Rosary Hotel of Burke's 4th District, all of these rules apply only at night. 1. If you find an open door while walking around the hallway, never look inside or enter the room. 2. If someone knocks on your door, do not open it. You should also never answer it verbally. 3. There have been cases where bodies have been found in the bathroom. Do not panic and simply close the door. 4. Rosary Hotel is on the first floor of the building. Upon the appearance or discovery of stairs, do not climb up or down. 5. Once you lie on your bed, please refrain from walking until morning. Otherwise, you might be transported to a different space at any moment. 6. Making noise in the hallway is not allowed. The use of magic is also prohibited. Sylvia blinked after reading it all. They were unnecessarily horrifying rules, and even her father instructed her to wear earplugs. She wasn't a young child to go exploring anyway, and she felt so exhausted that all she wanted to do was sleep right away. Laying down on her bed, her hawk Quickstone stood by her bedside. Good night. She greeted Quickstone and closed her eyes, falling into a silent slumber almost instantaneously. According to the clock, she slept for about three hours before opening her eyes due to thirst. Since then, Quickstone had been watching over her as she tossed and turned in bed. She felt relieved. Sleep comfortably. The hawk then closed its eyes as she rose and grabbed herself a cup of water on the shelf. After quenching her thirst, she turned around, finding herself standing in the middle of a hallway. Not her room, but an endless hallway. She felt goosebumps rise all over her body. Chills clawed their way up her neck, 
causing her back to waver. She remembered the fifth rule too late. 5. Once you lie on your bed, please refrain from walking until morning. Otherwise, you might be transported to a different space at any moment. Feeling the cold floor underneath her, Sylvia looked down and found herself barefooted. Yving. The wind blew, but she didn't know from where. Sylvia looked around and found a staircase not far away. She knew she shouldn't use them, however. 4. Rosary Hotel is on the first floor of the building. Upon the appearance or discovery of stairs, do not climb up or down. Let's calm down for now. As the wind blew ever so softly on her skin, Sylvia convinced herself that nothing bad would happen to her. With her will solidified, she stomped along the hallway until she stumbled upon a room with its doors open. She paused. 1. If you find an open door while walking around the hallway, never look inside or enter the room. She resumed walking, not even risking a glance. Nevertheless, she felt so nervous she thought her heart would burst. After a short while, she decided to try her luck. Standing in front of one of the closed doors, she knocked. However, no matter how long she waited, it didn't open. Fiving. Again, the wind brushed past her. Sylvia walked a little more and stood in front of a different door. Knock knock, nobody answered. She held the doorknob and twisted and turned it hard, but it didn't budge. With no other option left, she went to the next door. Knock knock, she moved on. Knock knock, as she busily moved through the corridor, she thought the people in the rooms might think she was the one the rules were warning them about. No, she was certain they clearly thought that. Screech. The wind hovering in the hallway turned into a dreadful shriek slowly, sounding like it was tearing through something. Sylvia hated scary things. Hence, instinctively, she applied even more strength into her knocks. Knock knock. Knock knock. However, nobody dared open their doors regardless. Hoo oof. Gradually, the grunts became clearer. Knock knock. She intuitively knew she no longer had time to reach another door. Gah. A cold breath brushed past her nape. At the same time, a door opened, and the strange sense of deafness she felt immediately disappeared. Flop. She fell, her entire body lacking any strength. Feeling the warmth of the room, she slowly looked up as she tried to catch her breath. Sylvia, Dika Lane called her name. Are you lost? He stared at her as if nothing out of the ordinary just happened. He even opened the door wide fearlessly. Come in. Sylvia contemplated. Yving, however, a bleak wind blew in the hallway once more, making her realize there was nothing to contemplate about. Regardless, she hesitated when she went inside anyway. Thank you. Sylvia bowed her head and looked around his room, which was as spacious and cozy as she expected. Have a seat. D. Lane sat in a rocking chair near the fireplace while Sylvia sat in a small chair beside the bed. I'm sorry. It's okay. When I got out of bed, I don't know how, but I found myself in the hallway. D. Lane picked up the book on top of the table. With his eyes on the page, he spoke to Sylvia. The concentration of mana in Burke's air reaches tens to hundreds of times the level of mana on flat land. Because of that, an unexplainable phenomenon occurs, which also causes magic to form shapes and ego. They're called phantoms, and there are many of them in this hotel. You should read the rules more carefully. Only D. Kalane could open the door, and the reason behind it was made apparent. He was immune to almost all mental interference. I see. Sylvia nodded. With her lips clattering, she looked around as she tried to calm herself down. Why were you late today? D. Lane answered without looking up from his book. You don't need to know. Wriggling her fingers, she asked him another question. Do you like books? It's the second best at most. He never liked books, but he found reading them the most relaxing hobby because of D. Lane's personality. He considered it one of his traits that he didn't need to overcome. Sylvia remained still for a moment. Looking at the fire in the fireplace, she then rubbed her palm together and cast magic. It's, scorched fire. She proudly showed it to D. Kalane. It had no sound and color, but it made the fire in the fireplace grow. D. Kalane glanced at it from the corners of his eyes. Great casting. I can give it colors, too. The, scorched fire, turned green. D. Kalane nodded in satisfaction. That's better. Sylvia, glancing at his expression, revealed a different magic. This time, 
her mana took the form of a cloud. This is, thundercloud. Well implemented. I can make it bigger. The thundercloud swelled up enough to cover half of the ceiling. Dika Lane replied. That's better. Sylvia, this time, conjured leaves that sprouted in the shape of a blade. It's, metal leaf. Good work. When mixed with destructive magic, the leaves will fly away and attack the enemy. You learned well. Sylvia showcased the knowledge and magic she learned from De Kalane's class, and since he was only giving compliments, she first thought he was just answering half-heartedly. However, she was proven wrong when she showed imperfections. The flow of your circuit is strange, which is a sign that you made a mistake in one of the points. You need to unfold it properly. The balance of your magic's properties isn't harmonious. To synchronize fire and water, neither side should be superior. That's the only mistake you made. He wholeheartedly corrected her, allowing her to understand and comprehend a few spells more clearly. However, her greed got the best of her. What's my weakness? You should know that yourself. Sylvia pouted. But you taught a fairing. Dika Lane shook his head. A fairing learned by herself. She clenched her fist unknowingly. Dika Lane was still looking at the book, but his pupils stopped for a moment. Don't be in a hurry. She shrugged. Sylvia, time is on your side. You'll be able to grow as much as you desire. Even without the help of the system and with just her own talent, she would become a wizard more perfect than anyone in this world. You're one of the best three talents in this dimension, De Kalane's words were based on the structure of the system, speaking only of a future so foreseeable it was almost fated to happen. He sounded so full of confidence that she couldn't help but look a little surprised as she nodded. Shh. At that moment, De Kalane suddenly raised his finger. Stay still. The sharp iron on his bedside moved. Almost at the same time, a strange figure appeared on the ceiling. It was a phantom, the accumulation of a cruel and nastily distorted mana. Sylvia felt tremendous fear, but it only lasted for a brief moment. De Kalane's magic tore the phantom apart mercilessly. After solving the situation immediately, he murmured calmly. I guess he came looking for you when I opened the door. Sylvia looked at De Kalane as she did her best to control her anxiety. To be exact, she looked at the iron on top of De Kalane's table. Did you kill the ghost with that? Yeah. Amazing. Sylvia's innocent admiration made De Kalane laugh. This is nothing to be surprised about. My weapon and magic are specialized in killing. The main quest didn't give De Kalane time to develop equally. Hence, De Kalane's magic was extremely focused on combat and killing power. He was defeated by Varen, however. What this world needs, Sylvia, is a talent in wizardry like yours. Magic wasn't made to kill people. It would be best if you remember that. Only then did Sylvia understand De Kalane at the round table today. She now knew for sure why he didn't berate the red box. Stop asking any more questions and go to sleep. Sylvia looked at De Kalane with surprise. Shouldn't we do night watches in rotation? It'll be useless. The flow of time is different here. I know. The mana phenomenon. Nights in the highlands are different. It's only supposed to last 10 hours, but it can last up to 2 hours, 12 hours, or even 24 hours, and nobody knows if and when it will happen. It all depends on the state of the mana that day. That's why you should just go to sleep. De Kalane's tone was firm but sweet. She felt confused. Did he consider her as Iliade's assistant, a student, or a fool who couldn't even follow the rules? Regardless, she laid down on the bed. S-H-H-H-K-K-K. S-S-H-H-H-H-K-K. Listening to the sound of the pages of a book turning in the embrace of the fire's warmth, she fell asleep. Before she did, she looked out the window with hazy eyes, finding a falling star. It was beautiful. Chapter 33 I went out of the hotel as soon as Sylvia fell asleep, following the, man of great wealth, Zintuition in. The form of lightning outside the window. Some supernatural phenomena occurred since I had intentionally violated the rules, but they weren't big threats. Rather, they seemed more like props and staff members of a low-budget haunted house amenity in theme parks. Where is it leading me? The mountain path from District 4 to the Elders Hall. This place was close to Burke's borders and was a high-end area that players could only reach in the mid to late stages. Without the Burke conference, they wouldn't even be allowed to enter unless they were an elder or a devoted student. 
That meant there was a high probability that I could acquire rare items here. I looked down the mountain range from Burke's Dark Summit. Ghosts and phantoms of all kinds tried to haunt and attack me, but they couldn't even surprise me no. Matter how much they rampaged. I did find their attempts interesting, at least. Swishinashin Rei Rudenei. Burke and Turnima. They seemed to be wondering why I wasn't surprised and thinking I was a fascinating individual. I destroyed the phantoms and explored Burke's mountain range, loitering around the area for a while with a, man of great wealth s vision turned on. Throughout my stay there, I saw tigers as big as a house and a snowflake that moved by itself, a snow. Spirit. I also came across a wildcat with twenty eyes. If possible, I would have slain them and used their parts as materials. Unfortunately, they didn't attack me first. All I could do was ignore them and slowly make my way through the dark mountains. Soon enough, a golden air current caught my eye inside the white coniferous forest, leading me to a charred spot. Bertan Kylas Winima. Ratarata Krasnima. The phantom spoke, but I ignored their words. At the end of the air current was a piece of wood that burned alone in the middle of the seemingly lightning struck area. Purified Magic Tree Fragment. Description A fragment originating from a magic tree, which contains plenty of mana. A lightning strike caused it to be ripped from its source and purified, thus becoming an excellent raw material for category. Miscellaneous item special timber. Magic trees used mana as nourishment to grow. Most trees couldn't absorb mana in water or air, but mutated ones sometimes appear that bear the ability to do so, allowing them to accumulate the magical energy. That was why they could become a threat to humanity and the best material for a wizard's wand at the same time. It was rare for them to be struck by lightning, however. Burke's magic tree was in perfect quality, and when a lightning strike hit it, not only did it mature quicker but it was purified by it. Excellent. A smile rolled up my lips. If I turned it into a staff or a wand, it would be a noble item that could tremendously raise a wizard's ability by more than half. I grabbed the fragment. Encouraged by this achievement, I moved hastily again. I even talked to the phantoms just in case. Guide me to the hidden treasures you're aware of. Krupaswarashiki. Pru uu They spat out mana, then giggled and laughed. You're no help. Ignoring them, I moved on and continued to explore with my ability open, but I soon realized I was now acting out of greed. Silently, I looked east and found the morning sun rising slowly. Touched by the first streak of daylight, the ghosts and phantoms lost their forms. The time for the conference had come once more. Sylvia opened her eyes along with the break of dawn. Fixing her hair, which had become as messy as a magpie's nest, and looking around, she noticed E. Colane was already gone. Sylvia, rubbing her eyes, tidied up her clothes and went back to her room. Quickstone was still sleeping on her bedside table. Knock knock. Breakfast is here. She waited until the clock hit 10 a.m., then ate breakfast. An hour later, a group of twenty began their walk back to the elders' hall along with their assistants. She felt sorry for Alan, whom she passed by on the street. He was being treated like an outcast simply because he was the weakest of them all. The conference began at noon once more, hoping to finish the agenda they couldn't finish yesterday. Naturally, it began with the continuation of the red box matter. The first person to open their mouth this time, too, was Bedin. Just as you Klein said, there is no definite proof that the red box are devils, but isn't it true that the devil exists through their blood? Tell me, is there a human with such a trait? Magic indeed flowed in their blood. The ambiguous relationship between the devil and the red box was derived from that. It was due to that gap that the wizard's suspicion rose. We don't know when or where the magic in their bodies will rage beyond control. It's highly possible for them to turn into a demon in no time. That is just mere speculation. Speculation? What are you trying to say? More than half of the wizards had animosity towards the red box. Right now, they were uniting to persuade D. Colain. Haven't you already decided that the red box are devils? Their whole clan hasn't even lost control of themselves, yet you already want to suppress them. Even if you can't, you pretend that you don't see them or simply act like you don't care like they're below you. All you've been doing so far is focusing on that one in a thousand possibility and use it as an excuse to drive out an entire race. But de Calaine was persistent. The magic that flows in them is faint, yet you're already labeling them as devils. That's no different from calling a cup of water a cup of salt the moment a pinch of salt has been mixed in it. 
everyone at the elders' hall, including Sylvia, wasn't expecting this. It was a development that they couldn't comprehend. D. Cullain was the one who downplayed the war his ancestors participated in 60 years ago. Ironically, the one that had made the most significant contribution to the murder of countless Red Box members. Was the Euclid family. It was through that exploitation that they gained partial rights to the Monostone mines. Even their religion is different from ours. Are we here to talk about religion? Has Burke become the round table of beliefs? If not, then bring that topic up in a church, not here. Betton clenched his teeth. Nevertheless, Euclid was persistent, and he couldn't do anything about it. Burke's round table members seemed equal at first glance, but some families had greater authority on certain items on the agenda than others. Of the twenty families gathered here, none clearly preceded Euclid's tradition and roots in the history of wizardry. The truth was, no one could undermine their authority over matters revolving around the devil's punishment. A demon hunter from four hundred years ago was found in an ancient book, and it was presumed to be the Euclid family's ancestor. If the direct descendant of such a bloodline claimed that the Red Box clan wasn't composed of devils. We won't be able to reach a conclusion at this rate. This Red Box agenda shall be skipped and brought up again at the end of the conference. Boom! Betton slammed his hand against the table and looked at D. Cullain with reddened eyes, who didn't even blink. We'll start the next item on the agenda after a short break. Ha 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 ha! As soon as Glytheon sat in the waiting room, he burst out laughing. Dad? This is fun. So much fun. Glytheon right now looked completely different from his usual fatherly appearance. While chuckling, he seemed to be in deep thought. Perhaps he was thinking about D. Cullain's true aim. However, Sylvia thought he would never find the answer since while it was simple, it was too simple for him to realize. What is that guy aiming for? Glytheon seemed so worried about it that the veins on his temples looked like they were about to pop. The real reason why D. Cullain changed, why he set aside his ancestors' disposition. Magic wasn't made to kill people. Those were D. Cullain's words last night. The round table easily reached conclusions for the agendas that follow the red box. Through it all, I only provided positive insights and light opinions to ease the other families' minds about the red box controversy, even by just a little. My words caused some of the family's anger to subside, but most were more interested in today's topics than in what I had to say. I wanted to activate, the villain's fate, but they treated those who defended Red Box as villains right now. That was only natural, though. According to the game story, in the first Burke conference, the Red Box's suppression was almost a definitive event. That aside, the conference ended after nine hours. What in the world do you want? Are you secretly raising a Red Box? Bedin grabbed me as soon as we got out of the Elder's Hall. I shook my head as I looked into his loathing-filled eyes. It would be best if you toned down your fury. Fury? No wonder. You deny the root of all of this since you only feel fury from me. It was your ancestors who regarded the red box as devils. My family followed your ancestors in war and were annihilated. Bedin glared at me, and I gazed right back. Bedin was short, but his body was firm, filled with both mana and stamina. Even so, there's no need to demonize their whole race. A wizard's rationale must be devoid of anger. Bedin clenched his teeth, followed by ridicules flowing through his lips. Don't think this is the last day of the conference. Don't misunderstand. I don't hate the beer ads. It does not matter. From now on, the beer ads loathe you. Bedin shoved past me. TSK. The truth was, Bedin's anger was understandable. The Biorad family was met with more enthusiasm than any other family, but they absurdly lost almost everything, including their family leader, 60 years ago. They didn't even earn anything in return since they achieved so little. They only managed to rise again because of Betton and his father's strenuous effort. A Cecil approached me not long after he left. I was suspicious of your sudden change of mind regarding the red box, but I share the same opinion. We should keep the temperature with the red box low from now on since that would benefit us as well. The rest of the wizards didn't say anything to me, but there wouldn't have been many good intentions from them even if they did. They obviously didn't like my remarks, but that was the fruit of D. Cullain's vicious conduct. I didn't regret it, though. If I considered this a sacrifice, then it was worth it. Starting with the next Burke summon, the intervals would be much shorter at one or two years, but the ways we would spend our time would become much more valuable. 
players would have grown steeply through those moments, but. In this world with no players, or at the very least, in this world presumed to have none, I could only hope that a named more good-natured than I would grow with the remaining time. The morning of the following day, I went down to the first district before leaving Burt. This town never ceases to be interesting no matter how many times I visit it. As could be seen from the enigmatic city built on the highlands, the motif of Burke was Machu Picchu. The landscape appeared mystifying and admirable, but I didn't come here to go sightseeing. I had a great material for a wand in my possession. There was a master craftsman in Burke, so I planned to order a wand after purchasing accompanying materials at a magic store. Is this expensive? While I was walking, I noticed a familiar face at a nearby market stall. Of course. It's a very precious material. Then show me something cheaper. Hmm? No, I can't. You said you were going camping. Still, if you're going to camp in Burke, you can't buy a cheap one. No, I won't even sell such an item to you, considering it would obviously get a person killed. It's okay. The Empire's Deputy Director of Public Safety. She was the one I came across while on my way to Burke. Lilia Premien, a key named. Alan's eyes widened as he pointed at her with his finger. Ah. What's wrong? I was able to come here, thanks to her. She's my savior. I see. I approached her, allowing me to hear their conversation clearer. Hey. Just show me the cheaper alternatives. Oh. You can't use anything else other than this one camping in Burke. Why are you saying it's the only one that can be used here? I asked if there's anything cheaper. You only need to tell me if there is or isn't. Yes, there's a cheaper one, but if you use it for camping, you'll be taken by the phantoms. No, forget it. If there's a cheaper one, just let me buy it. I wasn't sure if they were bargaining or quarreling. I stepped in between them as their anger began to boil. Both Premian and the storekeeper looked at me at the same time. That sleeping bag, how much is it? Oh, it's 10,000 Elmas. People are most vulnerable to bewitching magic while sleeping, but this. I'll buy it. I issued a check for it on the spot. The owner shook his head with a smile. No, we don't accept checks. Just cash, look at the crest. The owner surveyed the check carefully, where the Euclide family crest and de Colain's signature could be found. The owner looked at it in my face alternately then smiled. Ha ha ha. This has become an entirely different matter since you're the head of the Euclide. Here. Please take it. After buying it, I handed it to Premian who was standing next to me with a blank expression on her face. Take this. What? Why are you giving this to me? Premian took it with suspicion. Alan arrived safely because of you. Consider it as your compensation. My assistant professor laughed like a fool while scratching the back of his neck. He he. Hmm. Premian clicked her tongue in disapproval, but she still took it. I left and proceeded to walk around the market. Since Burke had a reputation for being a haven of magical materials, I easily found the ones I needed for my wand. White tiger's fang, white swan's feather, mana stone candle, etc. I spent 4 million Elmas just to buy 8 items. Of course, I didn't have that much in my personal account, but I used our family check to pay anyway. Uriel would be the one making the payment later. Even if she didn't, I could easily pay for them using the money earned by selling the vase. W.O. Alan shivered at my expenditure. Hmm? A restaurant caught my eye while we were walking, and though I wasn't hungry, its exterior and interior looked uncommon and luxurious. I went inside, almost as if bewitched by its appearance. Oh, welcome, Count Euclide. The staff recognized my face. To be fair, it seemed like it only served customers like me in the first place. A sly voice soon reached my ears, however. Oh? What's this? Tilda Y, if it isn't the noble Count Euclide the Rewain family head's cheap blonde hair first caught my eye. He had been enjoying wine since early morning. I Helm was about to say something but stopped abruptly. He was looking behind me with his eyes widened. What's this? Even Deputy Director Premian is here? I heard camping is your hobby, and I didn't expect to find you here at Burke. It wasn't until I Helm pointed out her presence that I found out she stuck to me. I come here only during my vacation, Premian replied with a sleeping bag on her side. She made it sound like she had always been a part of our group. Did I clear a quest that granted me a companion without me knowing? If so, 
I just gained a reward far more than the price I had to pay for her sleeping bag. I took a seat behind the table an employee assigned to us, but I Helm still spoke to me. His face was already red as if to show that he had already drunk quite a lot of wine. Hey D. Cullane, I'm curious. Why did you suddenly change your stance? Ignoring him, I ordered food for three people, including Alan and Premi Anne, who strangely still hadn't left. Have you never desired to beat the red box to death? They are an inferior species that do not deserve to live in our world. Don't you remember your thesis criticizing their clan at the university? I Helm sneered, recalling a distant past. He then glared at me with his alcohol-intoxicated eyes. By any chance, did you save a red box and turn them into a slave? Was there a genius among their kind who did your research for you? No. Alan stood up and shouted. Our head professor is nothing like that. Please refrain from insulting him further. I Helm smirked without disregarding his courage. If that isn't the case, then I can't possibly understand the situation. Why did you, of all people, defend the red box? What? Can't even say anything about this matter? I shook my head. No, it's just that your brain has become too rotten to understand my reasoning. I see. I Helm glared at me as he gave me an odd smile. I heard it took six months before you could present your research. No, was it three? It doesn't matter. Your underhanded tactics will be revealed you'll see Tilda. I Helm stood up, shrugged, then left. His tone and stare remained unpleasant until the end. If ever those words are true. This time, it was Premian who spoke as she looked at me. It will become a huge problem. I said it isn't. Alan shouted. Premian glanced at him as she continued. Slavery was abolished a long time ago. Even if they're a red box member, it would still be considered a serious criminal offense. Of course, only if it's true. Give me back the sleeping bag if you're going to continue talking like that. And pay for your meal as well. Premian smiled blankly and shut up. She didn't dare utter even a single word while we ate. Chapter 34 After finishing the meal, we immediately left the restaurant. Premian kept acting like an NPC since she thought she should at least guard me after receiving the sleeping bag. With that thinking, she even caught an adventurer trying to steal from my pockets. Soon enough, we stopped in front of some dilapidated wooden building. You can go now. I'll be on my way, then. I'll just consider this sleeping bag as something I picked up on the streets. Alan. Wait outside. Yes. Premian left, and Alan, who tried to follow me, stepped away and moved as I instructed. I knocked on the door and went inside, a scent similar to an antique bookstore immediately entering my nostrils. Gentle breezes slipped through the cracks all over its wooden walls. Is anyone here? I spoke politely and formally, which made me feel like writhing. However, the owner of this place was worth the highest formality. Yum. Who's there? A voice hindered by phlegm came from above, making me realize stairs were waiting for me at my blind spot. Creak, creak, creak. I felt as if every step the person took on the wooden stairs made the entire building shake. Eventually, an impressionable old man entered my view. I'm here to place an order for a wand. Wand? Due to his long, gray hair, he looked like a wizard. He put on his glasses and looked at me. Oh, aren't you De Culane? I bowed politely without saying a word. As I said last time. Hmm? Hmm. You. You've changed a lot. No, this. The old man's eyebrows shook, his wrinkles moving along with them. Has your soul been reversed? It looks like you've been through a lot. Your heart and the flow of your blood have become much gentler than before. Even the way you talk is different. My heart sank for a moment, but I didn't show it. I'm here to place an order for a wand. He nodded with a satisfied grin. Okay, I'll accept it this time. What kind of wand do you want? From the way he said it, it sounded like the old D. Culane had come here before as well. Well, even when he wasn't a player, he knew of the master craftsman Rockalock. Just a wand. Wands, staffs, canes. Magic wands have many different forms. As long as you use all of this, anything is good. I took out a fragment of the magic tree that I hid in my arms, causing the old man's eyes to flash. Oh! A magic tree fragment. If I use this, then it's possible. That's not all. I spread out all the other materials I purchased at a magic store. According to the, 
man of great wealth s eyes, all of these were of the highest quality. Rockalock's jaw dropped. Oh oh ho! These, along with the magic tree? Do you desire the best wand to ever exist? I'll be satisfied for as long as it's worthy of going down through history. Hmm. Why don't you add some blood, too, then? I couldn't help but think twice about his suggestion. He provided an explanation. Euclid's blood is good enough to be used as material. Your family has a deep and rich history, after all. Okay. I was worried that my talent might not be enough, but the old man would know if it would have a negative effect anyway and would skip it if so. Filter it well. I rolled up my arms, and he swiped his index finger diagonally across it, causing my forearm to be cut painlessly and for my blood to gush out. Controlling its flow, he placed it on a beaker. I normally don't take too long to make a wand, but I need to devote my heart and soul to the creation of this one. Wait for 10 days. I'll send it to you in a package. Packaging it would be a little too risky, but Rockalock added an explanation as if he read my mind. If I build a magical vault using your blood, no one will be able to open or break it aside from you. How much is it? 4 million Elnus. Including the vault and shipping fee. 4 million was much more expensive than I expected, excluding the cost of the materials. Uriel's distorted face came to mind. I disregarded it. I could earn 10 million Elnus from the vase anyway. Do you take family checks? Yuri Euclid. I nodded and issued a check. The old man grinned with satisfaction. Great. You'll get it in two weeks at the latest. Okay. I'll be on my way. Sure. Ho 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 ho. When I bowed at the old man's laugh, a number of messages popped up. Side quest completed. Rockalock's wand. First condition. Earn enough fame or notoriety. Second condition. Find the kind-hearted virtuous man or repentance. Third condition. Gain Rockalock's interest through high-quality materials. Fourth condition. More than two visits. Store currency plus one. A wand made by Rockalock. A quest was cleared out of the blue. Of course, it was thanks to Dika Lane, who dropped by here once before, though I didn't know when. Thanks. I left the store satisfied. Meanwhile, at the Freyham Knights commander's office, on the outskirts of the continent, Julie was having a conversation with Rayleigh, a relative who hadn't visited in a long time. I'm really busy these days, and I'm not earning much money. Adventurers can't do anything. All it does is put an even bigger hole in my finances. Honestly, I'm only doing this for my ID since it allows me to travel abroad with no limits. I'm envious. Julie laughed in response to Rayleigh's complaints. Ems. Knight, you made the right choice by turning away from the path of an adventurer. Ha ha. Becoming an adventurer was also an option that Julie once considered. No, there was a time when she had no choice but to leave it due to D. Colleen's pressure. Should I just throw everything away and leave? She used to have such thoughts a long time ago. Either way, Rayleigh. When Rayleigh finished talking, Julie quietly changed the subject. Yes? Do you, by any chance, know about D. Colleen's fiancé? She felt like her entire body was having an allergic reaction when she asked it. She violently swept her hair back. What? What about it? What's with your tone? Hmm? No, it's nothing. Just. Julie remembered the D. Colleen she saw some time ago at the tombstone of his deceased fiancé. She coincidentally stumbled upon him, and she didn't intend to peep, but it was also true that she couldn't bring herself to leave. His tears clearly showed how he felt about his fiancé. No, no. It's nothing. Well, I'm not sure. Rayleigh was an adventurer who graduated from the tower. She was two years D. Colleen's junior, which meant they knew each other from when his better half hadn't passed away yet. I don't know. I thought it was just two nobles dating. Not much has been revealed about them, so there's not much that I know. I didn't even know they were engaged. You didn't know? Yes, I just knew that she was sickly. She was always at home. Why are you asking me this? Rayleigh tilted her head, becoming suspicious of her motives, albeit a little too late. Julie shuddered her shoulders. No reason. You know she's already dead, right? Well, yes. Are you thinking you can use that as an excuse to break up the marriage? No, that's not what I meant. Julie sighed in vain. She simply became curious about how much he loved her that it was enough to make such a cold person weep. 
how he expressed his emotions so openly was hard for her to forget. It was clear he still hadn't forgotten his old love, yet, once a month, he requested for Julie to smile. Maybe, the reason why he promised to change was related to her. I. Do I look like his fiancé? Forget it. I was just curious. Hmm. Really? Knock knock, with a knock, Vice Captain Rockfell came in wearing, strangely, a black cape. Captain. What's going on? Rockfell bowed at Julie's words without answering. After a while, he bit his lips softly. He sighed, then finally spoke despite his voice sounding somber. Julie and Rayleigh's expressions grew stiff and cold. At the same time, at the Euclid head's office within Haiti Kane, Uriel gazed out the window while complaining. In any case, I'm the idiot who expected it. The anger that had piled up in her head hadn't been released yet. Why not me? Oh, so annoying. I know I quit magic halfway through, but I'm much better than. What's his name again? Alan? Alan? He didn't even look special. She could never understand why he chose him as his assistant professor and thought it would have been better if he took her with him instead. TSK. Well. It had been three days already anyway. She now had grown to roughly accept it. It's been more than ten years since we were last apart. She found it hilarious to be by each other's side now. At least I'm aware that we still hate each other. D. Lane doesn't like me, and I don't like him. I hate D. Lane. I hate him. Hattie. Tweet, tweet, while she was loathing, a sparrow lightly landed outside the window frame. Uriel looked at it with her arms propped up against the window. It didn't run away even when she opened the window stealthily. Hey, come here. She stretched out her finger. The sparrow hopped on top of it and began to sing a song. Chirp chirp, pfft. Strangely, animals liked her. She didn't even treat them that pleasantly. So cute. Now, fly away. As if following her instruction, the sparrow soared to the skies and flew above. Haiti came. The spectacular view of the huge city stretched out before her. Whoa Tilda. Uriel took a deep breath as she was overwhelmed with great emotion. Now, this land belonged to her. She wasn't a proxy lord anymore. She was a real lord. That fact made her every waking day delightful. Every morning felt new, and Haiti Kane's air and environment seemed lovelier than ever before. Knock knock. Ems. Uriel. Her butler came in. What is it? A check came through the family. Is it a trade payment? Uriel received the check with a good heart. The very next moment, her fingers trembled. Am I hallucinating? She hoped she was. She closed her eyes and looked at it again. It didn't change. 8.02 million illness? Yes. Who? What kind of expenditure is this? It looks like the head bought some items at Burke. Dumbfounded and with her mouth open, Uriel rested her forehead on her hand. Oh, that fucking, main quest completed, Burke's summon, store currency plus three rattle, 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 rattle. The slow tremors of the train, which was running at about 70 km per hour, felt awkward because of the person sitting next to me. Bedin. Coincidentally, due to the volume of the VIP carriage on the express train, we ended up sitting side by side with the corridor between us. However, we had been silent for two hours because of pride. As we looked sideways, our eyes met. Bedin spoke first. If it were 15 years ago, I would have demanded a duel. I thought it was a relief. I didn't want that to happen, considering I still wasn't strong enough to break through his barrier. But due to the provocation, my body reacted first almost unconditionally, like a reflex. I don't want you to die. It wasn't because there were three heads and four assistants in the same space. It was simply a matter of dignity and pride. D. Lane's unique personality was reinforced depending on who he was with and what the situation was. Duel at the next stop. Don't choose a magic death over a natural one. Magic rose beside Bedin, and I just looked at the energy with a light heart. Hey, everybody. Clap clap clap, the loud applause ruined my concentration. Glytheon, sitting in the back seat, had approached us with a satisfied grin and rubbed Bedin and my shoulders alternately. Calm down, Bedin. You weren't here 15 years ago. Back then, three people died on the way to Burke, six died during the conference, and two died after it. Seven of the casualties were assistants, 
but at least four of them were heads. He whispered in his ear. Or, do you really think you can win against D. Cullain? What? If you can't even reach your toes, you should at least know how to bow down. Bedin clenched his teeth at his whispering voice. However, he didn't refute his words. It was Glytheon, after all. Pat pat. He patted his shoulder. Of course, Bedin, who's always up for a challenge, has high potential. Challenges are the heart of a Biorad. Glytheon laughed. I felt burdened by his overestimation of me. But you really are something, Dika Lane, Glytheon murmured naively, his attention now directed towards me. In the past, you used to tell wizards off for no reason at all, but now you're looking for a fight over significant things. You talk a lot. Ha ha. That's because I'm old. You were so young 15 years ago, but you've grown so much before I could even realize. I didn't say anything. Beyond his shoulder, Sylvia was craning her neck and looking this way. He reached out to Alan next to me. Did you say you were Alan? Nice meeting you. This is the first time I have had this connection here in Burke with an assistant professor from the tower. Oh, yes, yes. It's an honor. Yes. You did a great job. Ha ha ha. Smiling slyly, he went back to his daughter's side. There had been no notable incidents since then. No talking to each other, and no threats. We all quietly and safely arrived at the platform. Ag Allen got off the train and stretched loudly. Looking around the place, the atmosphere of the landscape was much heavier than when I first came. There was heavy snow on the platform, and someone was looking at me through the snow. It was Julie, dressed in white armor and a black cape. She was also with her knights, who wore the same outfit as her. I approached her as she stared at me. Step, step. I walked on the platform, my footprints engraved on the ground that was slowly becoming a snowfield, and gazed back at Julie's trembling eyes. Once she was within arm's length, Julie spoke. I heard. Her voice was no different than usual. No, it was more solidified now, sounding rather frail but without even a little tremor. Is that so? I thought about what to say to her. In fact, I already arranged my thoughts. Varen, one of her knights, tried to kill me, and he met his end while we were fighting. I should at least tell Julie that. I heard you were attacked. But when I saw her face, my mind became strangely sloppy. There was an unknown emotion within me. I was certain it wasn't mine, but my mind was mistaking otherwise. No, it really felt like it was. I was. I knew her character. I knew her beliefs. Julie looked firm on the outside, but she's on the brink of breaking down internally. It's a relief that you're safe, Julie's tone was filled with sincerity. She continued talking before I could say anything. I read it in an article. You worked with him to save the survivors. I just stood still. I didn't know what article she read or what she was told, which meant I couldn't speak carelessly. I just have one question. The train arrived on the other side. What was he like? I chose my words carefully. I looked into Julie's eyes and thought deeply. Well, I couldn't lie to her. He was an emotional guy. Those were the only words I could utter. Julie took a deep breath and lowered her head. Thank you. We have to go now and see him. Please rest well. I watched her as she turned away, noticing her thin shoulders had been covered with snow. One of the many knights who was following Julie then talked to me. Do you want to come along? At the same time, many of the other knights looked at me. They were all Julie's henchmen. I was a bother to their eyes. I could bury this truth for Julie. The fact that Varen tried to kill me would cause their entire knight order to collapse and crumble down, including Julie. Her character was inflexible and upright, and she would be madly distressed by mistaking her subordinate's fault as hers. That was all I could do for her, however. I would never do a eulogy for the fucking bastard who tried to kill me. I didn't know if it was D. Kalein's ego or Kim Woo Jin's heart, but it was something that I couldn't even force myself to do. No. We'll go by ourselves. They left me behind and boarded the train when I didn't reply. I heard the sound of a tongue clicking as they did. Ha! Huh. I laughed in vain unknowingly. Those knight's eyes displayed all the rotten thoughts they had despite not knowing anything. It was so nauseating that my teeth almost chipped. Excuse me, Professor, Alan spoke up then. I shook my head as I stared at him. Alan. Yes? Yes? Be quiet. My anger was starting to boil. I felt like a ghost, 
however, since I couldn't see Julie's face. Regardless, if I didn't feel mad now, I wouldn't be human. Professor. Another ringing voice called me. I looked at its source, Sylvia. There was snow piled up on the top of her head and shoulders. Why did you put up with it? Sylvia looked at me while saying so. I didn't know what her eyes were thinking. The pitch of her voice, which was always steady, was a little odd. What do you mean? Sylvia rummaged through her bag without saying anything and took out something. Payment. A book. I just looked at it. Ah, I'll take it instead. Alan tried to take it for me, but Sylvia didn't hand it over to him. While they were having a trial of strength, she pushed him off. That left me no choice but to take the book that was being forced on me. I'm going. Sylvia walked away with her head down. As the train was about to leave, I gazed back at the black-clad group mourning loudly. My eyes met with Julie's, who was sitting by the window. Not long after, my eyes widened. Julie was smiling at me. It had no strength and was too vague to be called a smile, but the corners of her lips were raised slightly. She still seemed in pain, but... Once a month. She kept her promise. My mind was amazingly purified by it. Really? I thought what I was feeling was serious. Alan. Yes? Let's go back. I want to rest. I turned around. Chapter 35. Julie and her night order arrived at the scene of the incident, which wasn't too far from the fourth stop. It was less than an hour away from Bert. During the first attack, Professor D. Cullane managed to ensure the train's safety and rescue the survivors along with Sir Varen. An officer from the security department explained the situation. But the whole carriage fell from the cliff during the second attack, and Sir Varen allegedly went down. With it, the VIP carriage that Professor D. Cullane was in miraculously didn't, however. I see. The officer's detailing allowed them to understand what transpired properly. He also showed a copy of Roan's photograph. Unfortunately, this place is so remote that the only eyewitness accounts are the persons directly involved. Have you seen the article? Yes. Julie had already read it and saw the picture of D. Cullane calmly sitting inside a train floating in mid-air. Well, not all of the photos were released, just like this one. He showed one more picture. It was the corpses of the knights who attacked the train. Maybe the head professor subdued them. He's essentially no different from being a one-man army. Ha ha! The officer added with a smirk, but the knights did not laugh. Sensing the atmosphere, he regained his composure as he continued. Based on the pieces of evidence we have, it appears the two of them tried to handle the situation, and Knight Varen suffered from an accident during the second attack. Thank you. No worries. Julie bowed politely and looked around. The lands were white and endless, stretching far beyond the horizon. Just the sight of it was enough to send her mind to some distant memory. Rockfell sat on the tracks and mumbled like he was sighing. That fool. He lived diligently, only to meet his end just by being an escort. Julie couldn't hear him, though. Her ears felt numb and vacant. She thought she was used to losing colleagues, but she kept remembering the poor life they lost. Without anything to his name, he rose from the bottom at a young age and pursued his dream tirelessly, and after his countless efforts, he finally saw the light of day. Julie asked the officer. Did he happen to leave anything? Unfortunately, he didn't. Then, the one behind the attack. That remains unsolved. In the first place, nobody's supposed to be blamed for whatever happens throughout one's journey to Burke. The only victim of the incident is Sir Varen, too, which makes it difficult for the higher-ups to decide whether to investigate or not. It was an understandable concern. Julie nodded. My little sister Tilda. She heard a voice enter her ears, but she couldn't find anyone calling out to her. Surprised, Julie took out her wallet from her pocket, unexpectedly finding a crystal marble inside it. Julie hurriedly moved away from her position. W what? I heard about the incident. That's why I called when did you put this marble in my wallet? While you weren't aware, of course. Keck Josephine laughed. That aside, I heard a member of yours was attacked? Aren't you curious about the whole story? Are you saying you know the whole story? Of course. I'm the queen of high society. Many people out there would willingly give me anything if I asked for it. Josephine indeed had a lot of connections, which meant she could gather as much information about any topic as she needed. She could get her hands on and absorb almost all rumors in high society if she so wanted. 
Do you want me to tell you what I know? Julie was suspicious of her, but she had no external issues. On the contrary, Josephine's reputation was more beautiful than anyone else in this world. If it's illegal. It's nothing like that, so you better pay attention. First of all, the wizard family of the Riach kingdom is most likely to be behind the attack. At the conference 15 years ago, two of their heads were killed, and my guess is they wanted to get revenge, but not really on D. Cullain in particular. They were aiming for any head in the empire, and it just so happened that he was the one caught in that trap. As you probably can already tell, our world already has quite a lot of rumors about it. Julie was speechless. That would mean Varen was struck down blindly and was simply collateral. Damage. No matter how hard I think about it, though, there's something about it that I find strange. Roan was the one who requested Varen escort that train. Roan? Yup. Gallic has many henchmen, and among them is Rot's little brother. Rot's a businessman and my personal connection. Gallic. Roan. Rot. Julie frowned at the names. She knew none of them. You don't know them? Julie, you should at least know the name of. Julie looked at the knights around her as her older sister continued, finding them loitering around the tracks with knotted faces. Gallic. He's Glytheon's real brother. Julie opened her eyes wide. I'm sure you know Glytheon, and I'm honestly not surprised you don't know Gallic. Publicly, it's been more than 30 years since they cut off their relationship, but they can't fool my eyes. I don't know if they fought for real then or not, but I'm certain they're helping each other right now. I'm not sure about Glytheon, but Gallic definitely isn't above committing dirty deeds. What does Glytheon have to do with this attack? I still don't know. I'm wondering why in the world would Gallic request Varen to be the escort on that train myself. That's what bothers me. Anyway, that's all I've heard. You know the price for this, right? You should treat me some time. Okay. Good. I'm going now. Josephine cut off the connection. Giltheon. Julie thought about the Iliade family head. She knew full well about his bad reputation through its sight. But it had been ten years since he turned over a new leaf, making this situation closer to being a coincidence. But. What the hell happened there? Julie looked down at the cliff, causing rubble to roll down as she pushed it with her heels. At the bottom was a distant end of the fog-covered ravine. Her colleague's corpse was down there. The fifth week lecture for, Understanding Elemental Properties, was naturally cancelled due to the issue at Berkt, so I gave them homework instead, write a thesis about one pure elemental magic. I was certain some of them hated to do it, so I added a clause that they didn't have to do it if they didn't want to. Instead, I just deduct points from their grade. After that, I enthusiastically prepared test questions in the mansion. This time, they were my original works. Of course, they were still inspired by previous test questions, but their solutions and answers were certainly different. I also devoted myself to magic, which in turn resulted in my success in applying, basic fire control, technique to my, beginner psychokinesis. As a result, distant fire control had become possible for me to utilize. My next target technique was, basic earth control. After about a week of cycling between training, drills, and research, the day had finally come. I couldn't help but feel awe as I used vision to look at the questions I made. Amazing. A golden air current was swaying around the test paper, caused by the reaction of my, man of great wealth, ability. A total of eight items. Numbers 1 and 2 were focused on theory, while the rest mostly focused on application and practical use. Among them, numbers 7 and 8's level of difficulty was at least above a debutante. They would be correct if they thought numbers 1 to 6 were roughly one variable functions, and numbers functions. If they diligently attempt to solve them, they should be able to understand and come to the right conclusion. As an examinee or a wizard, the insights they would gain from challenging difficult problems would further push their growth. I came out of the separate building in a good mood, meeting Roy on my way to the main building. My lord. This is the result of the auction. Roy took out a piece of paper and handed it to me. It was a check with a breakdown for the result of, the flower vase of the master craftsman from the East S auction and the payment deposit. It was sold at a really high price? The final bid was no less than 21 million. Of course, it would only be between 13 to 15 million illness after deducting commission, tax, and other fees, but it was more than twice what I expected. Yes. 
We asked the tower to analyze the pedals components, and we received good results. The pedals are excellent for fatigue recovery and have beneficial effects on the skin. Thanks to that, the majority of the noble women participated in the auction. I see what you mean. Our earnings from it are enough to finance the mansion's budget, right? It is. Did you hear anything from Uriel? Yes. I spent about 9 million at Burke, yet she hadn't called me in a week. Was she cutting me some slack? Delivery. You have a package, Count Euclid. A shout came from the mansion's front gate. I came from Burke. The man shouting was enveloped by a grave aura. Looking at him closely, I noticed he had an adventurer's ID around his neck. Please sign first. Adventurers do deliveries, too? I asked while I approached to sign. Ha ha. We do anything as long as we're paid. I'll get going now. The box he left was heavy. My heart was pounding, inappropriate for my pride. Roy, go get some rest. Thank you. I went to my room at the main building, pretending that it wasn't a big deal, and confirmed my biometric information on the magic vault. As the box opened, I thought about many things. It had only been a week. The old man didn't make it half-heartedly, did he? Or was D. Cullain's blood too? Nasty? Despite having those concerns, I couldn't help but be captivated the moment the package finally revealed what was inside it. Rockalox Euclid Cane. Description. A cane made by the master craftsman Rockalock, dedicating it to Euclid. For the exclusive use of D. Cullain von Gray and Euclid. Category. Equipment Cane. Special Effects. Store a maximum of, 500, mana. The cane itself functions as a supplementary circuit, naturally increasing the user's magical performance. Item Characteristics. Steel Wood. Description. Increases the user's natural wood-related abilities and properties. The cane's body is made out of the highest quality of wood, providing it with immense physical durability and reinforcement. Self-study. Description. The cane studies, understands, and deciphers the magic performed by the user to help them use and cast it more efficiently. Aesthetic item. Description. This item's beautiful design is further enhanced by its ability to change its colors depending on the user's outfit. Blood of Euclid. Description. This cane's power excels even further when used for purging and exorcism. Its beauty and performance were already equal to that of an artifact, and that wasn't even taking its item characteristics into consideration yet. Rockalock took my characteristics from ancient times. Fortunately, he only included the good ones and filtered out the rest. This is only 9 million Elmas. Did I just get a huge discount? I fiddled with my cane, feeling the same way I did when I first bought a smartphone when I was just a kid. Hmm. It was childish to be excited with just a cane, and my next class would start in three days. I had to prepare for my lecture. Of course, its format had already been set and I already made a written proposal to borrow a classroom for the last class before the midterm exam, which was called, Combined Magical Combat Training. Wednesday, the last lecture before the midterm exam. A fairing arrived on the fifth floor of the tower. Today's class wasn't going to be held in class A on the third floor but the last floor. What else are we going to do? There were only three classrooms on the fifth floor. She held the doorknob of one of them and turned it. What greeted her made her jaw drop. Before her was an area so wide she couldn't see the ends of it. It had a hemispherical ceiling, a rectangular stage in the center, and even audience seats at the sides. It looked like a stadium. Wizards had already gathered in it and were causing quite the commotion. Ah, iffy. The CRMC members, including Julia and Ferret, approached her. A group of commoners naturally formed around a fairing, while her antipode was Sylvia. Nobles crowded around Sylvia, who was at the Burke Conference, an extraordinary place. Afarine glanced at Sylvia, while Sylvia didn't pay any heed to Afarine. At exactly three o'clock, D. Cullain appeared at the entrance, causing the noisy chatters to immediately subside. He was as confident and noble as always, but he held a cane that looked excessively luxurious in one hand this time. He just went to Burke. Did he buy it there? Welcome. D. Cullain headed to the middle of the stage where he continued talking while looking down at the wizards. Today's class is magical combat practice. Participating in magical combat was inevitable for wizards. Even if they tried to avoid it, they would ultimately fail. The debutantes were nervous. Also, clack. 
When De Kalane snapped his fingers, the veil on the edge of the stadium lifted. Huh? W what? Behind it was a crowd of hundreds of people, surprising Afarian and her classmates. It's an open practice. The wizards looked around in surprise and soon caused an uproar, but they were silenced when D. Kalane spoke firmly about the lecture's progression and goal. You may utilize any magic to battle against each other, but at least three pure elemental magic must be mobilized. It doesn't matter if you win or lose. I will focus solely on the battle itself, noting down your strengths and weaknesses as I observe. I hope you develop further with the foundations I've provided. Professor Rellin. Yes. Rellin appeared, a professor from the Department of Assistive Studies. He waved his hand, enjoying the attention of the wizards and spectators. Professor Rellin will regulate the battles to avoid life-threatening situations or damages, eliminating the need to limit yourselves. Ha ha ha. Everyone, just trust me. We'll start the class now. First one, Euroyan. Yes, yes. Dumbfounded, Euroyan raised his hand and climbed onto the stadium. Pick an opponent. You can choose anyone here. Ah. Uh, he hesitated at first but soon chose one of his friends, a man named Loden. They soon stood facing each other. You have three minutes. Begin. At D. Kalane's words, they exchanged magic awkwardly at first. Euroyan's fire spread thinly like a veil and enveloped Loden, who immediately intervened in its path using mana. Schwive 5. The flame's extinguishment caused steam to appear, which Loden then froze and launched like metal spikes towards Euroyan. Clang. Euroyan defended himself with a barrier. After their first clash, their awkwardness disappeared, allowing them to become serious. They repeatedly materialized, destroyed, and defended against each other's magic, but their bout didn't even last for a minute. Cook. A groan marked the end of the spar. The wizard who ran out of mana first was Loden. Euroyan wins, but remember, your scores depend on the process of the battle itself, not its outcome. D. Kalane took notes while monitoring the fights. No. To be more precise, his fountain pen was moving and taking notes by itself. Next, Beck. Beck, who Afarian thought was an extremely wicked noble, smirked and chose Ferret. Ferret climbed up the sparring field in fear. Begin. The two fired out pure elemental magic, but the difference in their level was clear. Ferret's support magic couldn't even withstand Beck's destructive magic for 30 seconds. Beck wins. Next, Rondo. The matches progressed minute by minute. While focusing on the debutante wizard's battles, Ifarian was caught up with an idea revolving around De Kalane's words, which kept bothering her. Pick an opponent. You can choose anyone here. The fights between wizards continued, causing electrical currents to thunder through the stadium and the ground to vibrate and tremble. Tiles rose, and metal surged up from flames. Even Ifarian couldn't help but be surprised by the electromagnetic gusts, created by combining wind and electric currents. Watching the matches awakened her desires dwelling at the deepest parts of her mind. Next, Ifarian. Finally, having her name called, she went up to the stadium alone without choosing anyone. All the wizards were looking at her strangely, but she paid no heed to them. Can I really choose anyone? Yes. Ifarian dropped her gaze for a moment. She got a definite answer from this. I can choose anyone. Anyone. Don't take too long, Ifarian. D. Kalane pressured her, but something was blocking her ears and causing her insides to feel warm. She felt as if mana was coursing through her blood vessels. Ifarian slowly raised her head. Aye. She then stretched out her finger, revealing its scars and calluses that served as the proof of her hard work. Soon enough, its tip landed on her target. Head Professor D. Kalane. Her ultimate goal was to defeat him with her own abilities. Naturally, she knew she still had a long way to go. However, she wanted to determine the difference between them right here, right now, by sincerely competing against him. She didn't care if she was years too early to challenge him. She didn't care if their fight would result in her defeat. I just don't want to miss this opportunity. Everyone in the stadium looked at her like she had gone crazy. Even a fairy momentarily thought the same herself. W what? You crazy bitch. Hey you. Get down from there. Professor Rellin came running while screaming, but Afarian lowered neither her arm nor her gaze. Naturally, D. Kalane didn't avoid her eyes. I. Afarian went back to the winter four months ago, 
remembering her emotions when she first saw him. I choose the professor. As she uttered those words, she saw it clearly. A faint but twisted smile on De Colleen's lips. Comment below. What's your favorite part of the chapter?